Nizi, can we start? Yes. Hi, Abba. We have a good number of participants who've already joined us. I think. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. And we have the panelists as well with us, the experts. Great. So let me uh, formally welcome you all uh, to the session on building sustainable businesses for the future. I'm sure you would all agree uh, that businesses that thrive in the future will be those that anticipate the challenges and embrace the opportunities of the future, placing sustainability at the heart of business strategy. Today's session on this theme is being organized under the ages of FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership. The center has been established to support the sustainability journey of corporate India. And its objective is to accelerate India Inc's climate action in line with government's commitments enshrined in the Panchamrit framework and adoption of mission life. I welcome our expert faculty for today's session we are delighted to have with us Mr. Nitesh Mahrotra. Nitesh is EY India Partner for Sustainability and ESG. He has over 20 years of professional experience and specializes in ESG governance framework, ESG maturity, and benchmarking across business models and value chains. He is part of Global Sustainability Executive Board at EY. An interesting thought that Nitesh has shared with us is that sustainability transformation needs to have the scale of industrial revolution with speed of digital revolution to create value for all stakeholders. I also welcome Mr. Ravi Roparel. Ravi is a director in EY Sustainability Consulting Practice and has 16 years of experience. Ravi currently leads the ESG Center of Excellence at EY India he has assisted leading companies across various sectors and geographies in their sustainability transformation journey. I now invite Nitesh and Ravi to share their experience and insights with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abba, for such a warm welcome uh, and uh, for the opportunity. It's an honor uh, to be here with you. And uh, I must commend Fiki and the founding members uh, for taking such a great initiative to do capacity building for India Inc. So thank you for the opportunity uh, and honor here. Um, uh, so what we're gonna do today, both Ravi and I, um, uh, I think uh, we have put together a, a quick discussion document in terms of uh, what are the impact uh, climate change and social inequity has uh, on, on the globe, uh, obviously on for India, uh, and I think uh, more importantly, as, as we all hearing this, uh, you know, both from a risk and opportunity standpoint, we have tried to put a little bit of a data led lens in terms of what the facts are showing for us at the moment, as well as uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and so Nidhi, if you can put the uh, presentation, please, uh, I think then we'll be able to guide through that. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Uh, uh, that Nidhi has just put. Uh, yeah, it's up. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, so as I said, I think uh, talk a little bit about in terms of both uh, protecting as well as creating value. And this, if you can see on the screen, is is the packed agenda uh, for for an hour. And I'm not pretending we can cover all of it, uh, uh, all the nuances, sustainability, climate change, and a lot of words that you start to hear. We can unpack a lot of it, but we try to keep it very sharp uh, in terms of uh, the climate action compass today, where we are uh, from, from a climate action standpoint. Uh, I think uh, talk a little bit about data, that how can data create actionable insights uh, for our business? Uh, and then what are some of the insights coming? I think more importantly, as you see the headline, I think sustainability is everyone's business, right? Because that, you know, irrespective of whichever discipline or function that we are in, irrespective of whichever sector, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's services, whether it's consulting, any business sector that you're in, it'll impact all of us. And I think that's a very, very important aspect that we will start to unpack today. Uh, and uh, also, I, I think as we say that eventually to be able to deal with this, we will need 
uh, technology at speed, innovation at scale, but more importantly, humans at heart, right? Because it's the adaptability and change management that we need to be doing to be able to solve some of that. And I think a depiction of that, as you see on the on the right, um, is obviously there is a lot of alphabet soup as as we will unpack in terms of sustainability in ESG frameworks, sector metrics that you may have seen. But eventually, whichever discipline that you're part of will impact us. Uh, it needs to have a sector domain because sustainability does differ from sector to sector. And uh, eventually, you'll need some kind of a digitization layer to be able to track sustainability performance, uh, as well as to take meaningful decisions, which can both obviously create as well as protect value for the organization. Uh, the other thing that I want to, uh, I think, just share at the upfront is that as we look at this uh, uh, infusion, as I say, from climate, nature, and business science, there are a lot of interdependencies, and and many would argue there is a lot of trade-offs. Right? It's not a straight line. You do one, the other gets impacted from uh, the six capitals that we all know, whether it's natural, whether it's uh, uh, human capital, intellectual capital, and obviously the financial and the manufactured capital. So I think obviously it does impact. Uh, what you see on the screen is we have put together the triggers on sustainability. We all know climate change is one of the top risks that we are all seeing is starting to play out and uncover here and now. Uh, from even all the recent trends and mega trends that you will see, uh, all of the reports and research looking forward, more importantly, not just looking back, is saying that uh, environmental, social, and governance issues would be very, very critical for us to be able to manage uh, as we move ahead. So I think clearly a mega trend which is playing out. Uh, the other one uh, impact is as we look at the global policy advocacy on climate, uh, and you may uh, have heard uh, the COP action, the climate, the, the conference of parties that happens. Uh, the COP28 happened in Dubai a few months ago. There is a lot of global action and obviously, as part of the global action, a lot of the actions that the governments have started to take, India has obviously also made very uh, uh, you know, strong commitments, and also we are on our own strong trajectory. So we'll talk a little bit about that, that how policy advocacy will start to impact us, uh, you know, our industry. Uh, I think financing, as we see, I think clearly moving forward, uh, all providers of capital would need to assess some kind of uh, sustainability performance before... Uh, they're able to lend money, both in terms of equity, debt, bonds. Uh, so obviously, there is a aspect on linkage of cost of capital and access of capital, uh, which more and more will become very intense, uh, as we see. Uh, I think also, as you see, from a customer standpoint, uh, and I think that's a very, very important impact from an India standpoint, that we are uh, part of the global supply chain. So our global customers will start to ask us ESG performance, and there will be some kind of of a pecking order that'll, that'll start to emerge uh, apart from obviously, uh, you know, the financial uh, aspects which customers start to assess. Uh, and last and not the least, I think every country on the planet is looking at some kind of an ESG performance regulation, data-driven reporting. Uh, it's not a compliance uh, because you need to produce data. And we all are aware uh, India uh, is ahead of the curve. India mandated BRSR. Uh, two years ago, we are on our own journey, but also other large mature geographies are following at the moment with uh, aspects on European Union. There is a very stringent regulation coming called CSRD. So if you have operations in, in EU, it will be impacted and also uh, multiple uh, regulations uh, from, from other geographies, including the US SEC. So that's a uh, you know, quick snapshot of all the triggers, uh, irrespective of the stakeholders that you'll have, that will start to impact us uh, uh, moving on. So I think this, what we put a little bit of a global climate action, as you know, uh, uh, we all know because of the fossil fuel and the human activity, uh, there is, uh, uh, the world is warming up. Uh, and if we were to see from pre-industrial level, which is from 1850 to now, uh, we are at about 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, degree Celsius. Paris Agreement, which is a historic UN climate agreement, as most of you would have heard, in 2015, uh, we all agreed, all 200 nations on the planet agreed that we should try and limit to 1.5 or well below 2 degrees Celsius. 
But I think if you see of all the commitment and pledges that we have made at the moment globally by all the uh, countries, uh, be it Global North and Global South, uh, we are uh, trending at about 2.1. But more importantly, if we were to look at the action on the ground, we are heading towards somewhere around three degree trajectory. So uh, obviously a lot needs to be done and we need to be able to run the talk, as I say, and more importantly, the emphasis on actions uh, that needs to happen, whether it's by the state, the government, all the leading enterprise, which all of you kind of represent. So I think that's the heart of it that we need to be able to manage, uh, you know, as we move ahead, uh, moving on. So a quick analysis, uh, I think a lot many people say that, look, uh, what does uh, uh, a tenth of a degree uh, matter? So I think as you see from the numbers, uh, and there is a lot of science that is behind that, uh, which has been uh, in progress for last 20 years, I would say about 20, 25,000 scientists who have been researching this across the globe, representing all geographies. I think the science is very clear that even a tenth of a degree matter a lot to humanity. And obviously you're seeing the impact that is having on nature and uh, the other signs that is emerging on the planetary boundaries. Uh, uh, there are nine planetary boundaries that have been mapped. And at the moment, six of them are beyond the trigger point at the moment. Uh, so I think, again, a cause for real worry and the impact that will have on our businesses and our supply chain is very, very uh, critical and, and some would say existential uh, in, in many ways. So, so that's a quick analysis. Moving on. Uh, some more data that we started to put, uh, as you see, uh, 70, 7 to 10% of the GDP is at risk, uh, you know, obviously, and, and a lot of data that's around there from various uh, institutions that have been researching. I think more importantly, uh, you know, as we all know, uh, 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 what's being put out is that we would need three to four trillion dollars a year uh, by 2050 to be able to mitigate. Uh, and the impact that will have is much more. So in a way, a lot many people are starting to argue now that it's easier or it's cheaper to save the planet than destroy it, right? Because the impact and risk that it would have going forward would be significant. Uh, the other thing that you see here is the cry for climate or uh, financing, both from a mitigation and adaptation standpoint. And uh, I think uh, while a lot of activity and financing have started to move, obviously, as a country, we are saying that isn't enough by a stretch. We need more from the developed nation, uh, uh, right, because they've consumed a lot of the carbon budget and we would need that support and technological advance to be able to uh, grow in a sustainable manner. But the important thing, I think, from a country standpoint is adaptation, right? It's not only mitigation, adaptation, because some of these risks will fructify and we need to be able to adapt to the changing conditions. And that's why I think the financing gap, as you see on, on adaptation, is very, very significant, uh, which is for uh, a country in the global south and a growing economy, I think, is very, very critical. Uh, so I think some of the aspects that we will uh, you know, need to do more from a financing standpoint. So that's a quick uh, analysis. Uh, moving on. I think some uh, uh, stats, I think there is lots, and I think all of us, um, uh, I'm sure, and people in the agriculture sector, and, and uh, I think everyone's starting to see the impact of climate change directly, indirectly. Uh, these are just some headline news. I think from an India standpoint, uh, I think the big aspect is that if the monsoon pattern was start to change and which would change given this uh, global warming, uh, uh, what would be the impact on the economy? I think is a big, big uh, uh, aspect which is now under consideration. And also, I think we all know that India is on the front line in many ways because we have a, a very significant coastline exposed to water. So as the cyclones and the water levels start to rise, how would it impact, uh, you know, our, our mainland, I think is also a very, very important area and also the agriculture, needless to say, because uh, obviously we there is a big, uh, you know, GDP implication on agriculture, which we would need to be assessing. So obviously, uh, I think the point is very clear. It's here and now it's been happening. And how do we able to both mitigate and adapt uh, to this uh, changing uh, aspects because some of that we actually now need to adapt there isn't we can really mitigate 
So I think that's a quick, uh, you know, snapshot in terms of the implications that we'll start to see for any of the businesses that we are on uh, moving on. Uh, I think here that we try to put to put some analysis, and I know it's 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 a hotly debated topic that uh, you know how would it impact our GDP uh, as we move forward, uh, and I think there are various projections. This is one of the rating agencies which has done recent analysis in terms of risk to our GDP, and as you see, it's very very significant uh, for for a country. Uh, like India, which is a develop, developing nation and also on the front line in many ways uh, of this whole challenge and also the impact to our population. Uh, and one of the things, as you see, is obviously the readiness score that you see. Uh, so lower the better. So I think that's the one that we need to be uh, you know, checking for, that how are we really mitigating and adapting uh, to some of these changing conditions. But Needless to say, I think the impact is significant and we need to be able to translate that to every business enterprise that you represent directly or indirectly, whether you're into financial services, whether it's into real economy businesses, but it would impact every part of the uh, you know, business model that is out there. So I think something to think and obviously be able to do some kind of a climate risk modeling, uh, looking ahead more importantly, uh, moving ahead. Coming to a little bit on India, obviously, I think India, while we see a lot of risk, truth be told, uh, India is doing a lot, uh, you know, as, as we see relatively. Uh, India has taken bold commitments. Ava alluded to, uh, you know, uh, our commitments that we have made in various COPs uh, globally, as well as in the country. Uh, I think a net zero target of 2070, while, uh, you know, as per the science, the world needs to get to 2050, net zero. But I think for a growing economy like us, uh, I think uh, it's still very ambitious. Uh, and I think uh, it, it, it is very commendable that India has taken these strong commitments. And most of them, as you see, relatively, we are exceeding as compared to other nations. Uh, uh, so I think that's on the policy side. And we all know, I think a lot of commitments have been made in the budget, uh, as well as in a lot of policy actions that have happened. I think we led from this, even on the G20 uh, that 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 you may have followed. I think at the bottom, as you see, is definitely the the India Inc. How they are responding, and obviously the capital markets regulator. Uh, again, I, I think uh, first of its kind, where thousand companies by market cap uh, had to uh, have been reporting. I must say, for last two years, uh, ESG performance through a data led approach. Uh, uh, there is obviously now reasonable assurance also coming through value chain, which we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, but also, uh, I think the the pressure on investors, and I think that's the main push that the government is trying to see that as we look at attracting foreign capital and this make in India uh, movement and Atm Nirbhar Bharat, I think uh, some of these aspects are very, very critical for us to be able to driving trust and confidence in the global world that we as part of the global supply chain can really deliver and our, our economy is resilient to some of this. And I think that's why a lot of these actions that you're starting to see both at the policy side and I said from the leading enterprises, which most of you are obviously part of and, and representing uh, here. Uh, moving on. Uh, so what we've done in, in, in this slide, as you see, I think at, at a lot of times at the board level and, and senior level, there is still a discussion while I think it's non-negotiable that we have to be doing this sustainability and ESG is a social license to operate in many ways. Uh, but uh, I think talking to leading organization in the globe in India, uh, we have put together a brief model as you see, and obviously there would be more parameters as we look at from a data led view, but all these aspects that you see creates a very, very strong business case uh, for sustainability. Uh, I'll be honest, I know there is a lot of debate is sustainability a revenue, driver or a cost function, I think in medium term and in short term, it does lead to cost uh, because uh, there is a trade-off. I'll be honest. I think you can't have it all. Uh, uh, but I think over a period, as the company starts to improve the resilience and get towards green products and, and newer ways of working, I think the value, uh, the business case, if I may, eases out a lot. So I think these are all the parameters that we need to be measuring. And importantly, I think, which is very small uh, at the moment, but the access and cost of financing 
I think would also be more and more linked to ESG performance. So obviously, making a very strong business case that from a long-term value driver, sustainability has to be at the forefront and a non-negotiable for every leading company, every leading SMEs who wants to play uh, at a competitive level, as well as more importantly, at a global level, which is where most of our aspiration is to be, uh, you know, be, be able to uh, have a hub uh, for the globe. So I think that's a quick uh, proposition uh, that we have shared. Uh, moving on, if we go to the next one is, uh, uh, is we to put together a quick uh, kind of a roadmap for us, because I think that's the other discussion that happens is that uh, it's a very complex subject. A lot of things are intertwined in it. And what could be an, an illustrative roadmap look like, which is more modular, and we we work uh, uh, in, a, in a structured manner. So I think, again, talking to and working with a lot of leading organizations and in India and globally, uh, this is a little bit of a structure that happens, obviously, starting with some kind of a framework or, or refreshing of the strategy from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, I think compliance for all of us is non-negotiable, as we all know. It's table stakes in many manner. But then I think importantly, work on the business case with data so that we can we can say and, and share with confidence to all our stakeholders that it does create sustainable long-term value uh, uh, for the organization. So, so obviously in a way to say that it, it helps us to outlast and also outperform uh, in, in the medium and long term. So that's a quick uh, kind of a roadmap that we have uh, shared for, for your analysis here. Coming to, I think this was the other discussion that we wanted to have is uh, this aspect as we call on environment, social and governance. And I know I talked a little bit uh, or more about the climate action, which is around the environment and and uh, uh, the the global warming uh, that has happened or global you know heating that's at the moment. But uh, this term that has been coined by United Nations is about 17, 18 years old uh, at the moment. and I think that the discussion has been that while climate is, is at the forefront and obviously that's the main challenge and energy transition, but without social, without people, human capital, we can't really solve for it. And that's where this pillar on social, which is around our human capital, our extended supply chain got added. And then a lot many people argue, and I think we all know it's very true, that while environmental and social are goals, governance is how we get there. And I think if we don't have a strong tone at the top from the policy advocacy, from our boards, from all our stakeholders in alignment, then we can't really achieve and sustain uh, this relentless effort that is needed. And that's why I think these three uh, terms got added, environment, social, and governance. And that's where this, uh, you know, the alphabet soup has started to emerge for the last 18 odd years, as you see, uh, and obviously many of the acronyms, which I'm sure you're aware you are following are, are part of this and, and many uh, continue to, to add. Uh, but I think the while that's been one of the challenges, I'll be honest, for many people to, to have a harmonization of language, uh, uh, but uh, it is complex, I'll be honest, uh, because obviously it's multi-stakeholder, the investors want something else. The regulators may want to have a different lens. Obviously, the customers may have a different lens to it. So I think that's why in a multi-model harmonization is difficult. But having said that, uh, I think in the last two years, as, as some of you have been following that space, I think the harmonization or the simplification of the language has starting to happen. And I think one of the most important is uh, the body for financial accounting, which we've been all used to for last 40 odd years, we know what is EBITDA, what is revenue, top line, standard ratio. And I think the impact from IFRS, which said accounting for what really counts, right? So we need to be able to account for carbon, water, nature, social. And that's where I think uh, a lot of these languages and accounting, as I may say, is getting harmonized because uh, I think the point is clear that if we can't really measure, we can't improve. And obviously we can't have a standard language. So I think a lot of harmonization starting to happen and you'll start to see more and more harmonization that will uh, happen so that we have a standard way, just like financial reporting, we have a non-financial or an integrated 
view to all the capital so that we can share, communicate, uh, and also assess what value are all of these capital creating uh, for an organization. Uh, so that's the quick decoding of the ESG alphabet soup, uh, as I like to call it. Uh, uh, moving on, please. So what we've done just to bring this to life, this alphabet soup uh, created a two by two. Uh, uh, what is uh, mandatory or getting mandated uh, across the globe? Uh, what is voluntary? Because a lot of these frameworks have been voluntary and a lot of the leading organization that you represent have been following that for many years. And I know India Inc., I'll be honest, have been following there and doing their fair bit on a lot of that. Uh, also, some of them are very focused on a topic. Some of them are very comprehensive on the ESG data model, as, as we talked about. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, uh, importantly, as organization looks at uh, a data model that we will need from an ESG, we have to take the best of what exists and obviously be able to harmonize this uh, from both regulatory investors and customer as a cohort so that we can have a integrated view. But that's a quick snapshot for you. I think the other important thing, as you see here, is that more and more, uh, all of these frameworks are getting towards a sector approach because we all know uh, while every company is unique, they have our own business model, uh, but we need to be able to sectorize this because the, uh, the challenges a cement company have versus a steel company versus a financial services, uh, you know, versus any other company is very, very different. So I think the sectorization is one thing that we are hearing more and more. And the other thing is that it should not just be looking back, uh, uh, it also should be looking forward because that's where our stakeholders need and our board needs inside in terms of how do they navigate uh, this complex uh, language that is starting to emerge more and more. So that's the quick uh, uh, snapshot uh, here uh, for all of you. Moving on, please. So what we've done uh, to bring this to life, uh, the two by two that we saw, I think we tried to capture uh, what does it all mean to simplify this? And I know this is still an L1, uh, the taxonomy, if if I may, which is the, the language that needs to be there, I think uh, obviously is getting standardized. But as you see within environment is climate, uh, which has been the buzzword, but also a lot many people argue that climate and nature is intertwined. So how do we measure natural capital, uh, things around water, which is a huge issue in the country, as we know, circularity, biodiversity uh, becoming very, very critical. So nature, I think you'll see uh, getting added uh, more and more. How do we measure some of that impact, risk and opportunity? Obviously, is easier said than done, but we need to have some kind of a data model to have uh, for both uh, climate and nature. Uh, the other thing is obviously on social and this is where I think uh, there is a little bit of confusion. A lot many people think social is just CSR, but obviously it's it's about our human capital, uh, both from our own workforce and our extended value chain workforce, which is there. I think the impact that we're having on communities, both in terms of risk as well as uh, you know a positive impact, I think is important to measure. And also obviously our consumer, which is obviously our most important stakeholder, as we all know. And then obviously the governance aspects, which needs to be measured, which are very, very critical, as we all know, from a regulatory and from an investor standpoint. So that's a quick kind of decoding of the data model, if I may. Uh, and, and I know my colleague Ravi will talk a little bit in detail on, on, on the data model as we move ahead as well. Uh, so moving on. Yeah. So this, I think what we've done, some of you may have seen this framework as I talked about that. How do we classify a business sector from a sustainability standpoint, right? And these are... Uh, about 77 sectors, as you know, subsectors, uh, and each of them have a little bit of a different uh, materiality, as we call it, as well as the metrics that is worth measuring uh, from an enterprise risk standpoint, right? So uh, again, uh, I would urge all of you, if you're not sector, use this framework, uh, which is now embedded in IFRS, uh, I think uh, becoming more and more sector oriented. So again, less is more in this KPI game, as I call it. But I think it's important that we know what the KPIs and, and also be able to benchmark our performance, right? Because the other thing that we hear from companies is that they know where they are, but how do they know what's good, bad, ugly? What are the leading practice? And I think a framework like this helps us to be able to benchmark the performance, uh, you know, in a, in a harmonized sector standpoint. Uh, uh, moving on. 
this is a quick snapshot as you see uh, you know obviously a lot of investors a lot of agency do look at the model differently the algorithms may be different between the weightage uh, across e s and g uh, there is a lot of fears debate that should they be weightages uh, what should be the data model but a quick snapshot to our earlier point that every sector would have a different uh, view obviously technology the climate impact or or renewables and decar would be much lesser uh, obviously social would be much bigger so i think quick analysis i think governance is sector uh, agnostic so to say so obviously and that's been a lever that all of the companies have been working for so a quick snapshot in terms of how the illustrative weightages across uh, different sectors would be and uh, important to align our spend our r and d capex uh, in with in line with some of these prioritization that's i think that's a key point that we have seen from leading companies uh, uh, moving on please yeah i think again a good framework as you look at the the value chain that you have uh, typically in a manufacturing setup you will have buy make move sell i think depending on a financial services the the value chain would be very different but i think the point that we have seen from leading enterprises as they are working and embedding this in their strategy look at the entire value chain start to see what are the positive what are the negatives uh, what part of the value chain or a discipline or a process is impacted more so that we can look at it but importantly as you see in this slide again every discipline of an organization irrespective of whatever role function that you're on sustainability will impact you uh, and and i think that's the point uh, of saying that sustainability is everybody's business so we need to understand the language more and more for differentiating and be able to thrive in our career as well as in our enterprises so again a quick kind of a snapshot that leading organizations uh, look at uh, to map uh, both the positives as well as uh, the risk uh, sustainability would have uh, moving on please yeah i think i now i'll hand it over to ravi to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the regulatory aspects which is obviously non negotiable and more importantly bringing this live to some of the data points that we said and also some of the benchmarking ravi and team have done for about 1000 companies so stay tuned i think lots to come in the next 10 minutes so ravi uh, over to you yeah thanks thanks nitesh and uh... While before I start, just to uh, take a pause and reflect, so Nitesh covered entirely on the business imperative side of it in terms of how sustainability is more from the business side of it rather than a compliance activity. Now I think what we'll uh, spend a few minutes on if we, uh, while we are looking at measuring, monitoring, improving our performance, how do we also at the same time look at reporting and communicating to our stakeholders? And that's where this uh, uh, slide sums up the entire uh, sustainability reporting mandate, which the uh, the capital market regulator has uh, uh, given for the listed companies. Now, if we reflect on this entire journey, it, it has been there for a long time, right? more than uh, 10 years. But initially, it started more with a qualitative disclosure to say that whether companies have a policies in place for certain activities which are sustainable. And, and it was more a qualitative side of it. But as uh, the, the journey has evolved in the last two, three years, it has uh, taken a, a leapfrog jump in terms of qualitative to quantitative disclosure. And, and that's where a big shift has happened. And uh, one thing I must mention here is that India, the Indian market regulator is certainly uh, one of the, uh, the initial ones who has come out with a very comprehensive data-driven framework, which is mandatory for reporting by the listed companies. Uh, even if you look at the European Union, just effective from this year, US is still uh, in the works right now. And there are certain jurisdictions which have made it mandatory now, but I think certainly among the first ones, India is far, far ahead that way. And uh, we have a good data available. Uh, so in the last uh, year, the uh, one th more than 1,000 companies have reported on sustainability performance, just like companies report the financial performance. This is where the companies have reported non-financial performance in a very structured uh, manner which has given a good, I would say, a macro view in terms of uh, where do we stand in terms of the sustainability impact that you are creating as a business. And as we go ahead from here on, I think the entire uh, reporting landscape is being uh, continuously being enhanced to meet the evolving requirement. And that's where this uh, uh, the entire value chain disclosure, which means that uh, while companies have been reporting on their own sustainability data, how do we also bring the entire wider ecosystem, which is the upstream and the downstream value chain within the, uh, the ambit. And so that we look at entire end-to-end -end transformation, not just within the, the within the remit of the of the boundaries of the organization. And that's where a big shift is happening where uh, not just companies are in a way in a position to influence or make an impact, not just within the, the, the own operations, but also in the upstream and the downstream side. That's the 
I think uh, and and uh, major shift that is happening and where a lot of work need to happen to be ready for for that particular uh, evolution. The second side is that on the entire uh, data that has been reported by the companies uh, last year and the last last year, it was all voluntary in nature, which means uh, uh, doesn't require assurance. It was a voluntary assurance uh, requirement. But now from this year onwards, as the companies publish their annual report, the top 150 companies uh, by market cap need to also submit a reasonable assurance. And, and when I say reasonable, it is more stringent compared to limited assurance, which is what has been the wider market practice from the voluntary assurance point of view. And this is where the entire, I would say, the, the detailed, I would say, assessment in terms of data, process, control, completeness, accuracy will come into picture. Just like we have the entire data completeness accuracy for financial reporting, same rigor and same governance needs for the non-financial data, which is a sustainability data. So that, that's the, uh, I would say, the key takeaway here. Now, if you move to the next slide, we will take a quick look in terms of uh, the, the key uh, topics or KPIs where the assurance is required, as well as uh, uh, the impact in the wider value chain need to be to be measured and communicated. So if you look at this on the environmental social governance, the key topics in terms of energy, water, waste, and circularity are the ones from the, the, the environmental side of it. And largely aligned to the global uh, voluntary and the mandatory framework in the other jurisdictions that are, that are emerging. So that, that's one that is covered. Uh, there's a possibility that this KPIs will, uh, some of these are new new for this year, but this will continuously uh, keep getting updated. Uh, uh, and and uh, as the global uh, reporting landscape, in, uh, uh, I would say, matures. This will further keep enhancing and widening. So it is not just a, a destination. It's more a kind of an ongoing dynamic journey that all of us have to be uh, you know, very active on this one so that uh, we are at par with the market practice of how the shift is happening. So that's on that part. Similarly, if you look at the social part and the governance part, a very uh, unique and important one, social being a much more uh, bigger impact for a country like India where the entire uh, diversity and learning skill development is something a major focus area for for the country as well as the as the organization. So that's one thing that need to be looked at to see how do we enable that entire people and society transformation uh, so that uh, we have an end to end uh, I would say evolution and not just limiting it to a climate change is one topic which may be while most important but not the only one from the sustainability point of view there. Moving on to the next slide, where I think uh, looking at if we have to uh, do this entire reporting, right, which is uh, a, a reliable structured reporting as well as on the assurance side of it, the data and the traceability of data is the, at the heart of it. And the, the data is the one which will be the main guiding principle for us to say that where do we stand, what are the areas where we need to improve. And for that, having a reliable data is very important. Uh, today, uh, there are many pockets where uh, the, the, the data may not be available or we have just recently started putting together the data. But the backend side of it to say, how do we mature the process and the systems through which the data is captured so that uh, there are no incompleteness or uh, gaps in, in the reliability of the data. And that's where this entire activity in terms of uh, tracing the data, streamlining the process systems need to happen. And that becomes our... Uh, I would say the entire evolution when it comes to uh, the data-led decision making and reporting there. Moving on to the next slide where uh, this is, uh, I think, quick glance in terms of the, each of the stages. So the, the, the define, measure, monitor, benchmark, disclose, and communicate. While the disclosure and the communication is uh, a mix of both uh, mandatory as well as voluntary, uh, but the entire part prior to that one, which is uh, measure, monitor, benchmark, is where the entire business case comes into picture to say that reporting is just a byproduct and output of the entire entire work that is happening. The bigger impact need to be created when we look at defining our priorities and strategies. How do we measure the impact that we are creating? How do we monitor the performance? And then also benchmark with the wider ecosystem uh, in terms of how the entire India Inc. is evolving and also the global supply chain and, and, and similar way, how do we also keep keep uh, at par with that one? So that's the entire focus of the spotlight that we need to keep in eye and reporting becomes a byproduct of that one. So that's the uh, broad idea. Now, if you look at the, uh, the data model to say that uh, what is the data that we need to look at and that's where you see this uh, environmental social governance, uh, the circles and within that the different uh, uh, KPIs and deep time into it. But if we, if we step back and reflect, right, there are three sets of data that you see on the left-hand side, mainly is on one, the enterprise data, which is the company's own data within the, within the organization. 
Second is the third party data, which means what our suppliers and our customers are doing in terms of uh, the transportation, in terms of upstream, downstream uh, uh, impact. And also the external data of how the external stakeholders, whether it is investors, rating agencies, how they perceive our performance, right? That That's something which is very important. And that entire rating and the scoring is something that the moment we plug it into our perspective, it gives us a comfort that there are no blind spots in the way we look at the entire uh, performance of our organization. So that's the most, I would say, the important part to keep in mind. And uh, certainly the entire technology and the data platform is something which is crucial uh, because uh, looking at the volume of data, there are uh, all, almost 300, 400 KPIs that will be into this entire journey. How do we have a structured platform which helps us manage the data at central uh, place and also monitor? So that's the, I think, one fundamental thing that needs to be looked at there. Now, uh, coming to the supply chain part, while uh, uh, the, the entire this uh, new requirement that has come up in terms of the value chain disclosure by the by, by the CBS part of BRSR core, how do we look at uh, enabling the entire ecosystem by starting with uh, putting putting in place the policies in terms of responsible sourcing policy, the sustainable supply chain guide, guidelines, and creating capacity in the supply chain, right? Because uh, while mandating certain disclosure is easy, but how do we create the uh, entire uh, capacity so that everyone understands this particular language of uh, what it requires, what needs to be done, and what could be the implications in case uh, the performance is not up to the mark. So that, I think, the entire thing on the capacity building program is one major activity that needs to happen with a lot of uh, rigor and a lot of uh, uh, speed. And, and, and that will lead to an entire countrywide transformation, right? When we set our uh, uh, national targets and communicate our performance, this is where the entire bottom-up uh, uh, or the change will happen to say, how do we create this entire change within our supply chain, it could be uh, large, medium, small enterprises. And the bottom-up impact of that is huge on the national targets or the performance that we see there. So that's on the capacity building side of it. And also looking at our suppliers, how do we look at our suppliers into different uh, uh, dimensions in terms of critical suppliers, non-critical suppliers, category A, B, C, and how do we identify them, right? So it, though there can be multiple parameters around it, but identifying that it will be very critical. And also working with the suppliers to innovate, right? Not just uh, to, to impose some compliance requirement or some mandatory disclosure requirement, but how do we incentivize, how do we uh, encourage our suppliers to innovate and then give some preferential uh, uh, procurement terms or something which will support that particular change. It is the most, I would say, critical part to look at from the business standpoint. And uh, once, say, the suppliers' uh, data have been collected, how do we score the suppliers, right? To say that uh, while uh, the entire technical commercial evaluation happens as part of the supplier scorecard today, how do we also embed sustainability into that one so that we have a sustainability score for the suppliers? And whichever suppliers are scoring better also gets motivation and incentivization to do more and also get a more share of business. So that could be a certain ways in which the uh, reward framework can work around it. And lastly is that how do we uh, entire the work with the supply chain to improve the performance wherever required and track it through a very comprehensive action plan and enable that uh, implementation wherever required through capacity building, handholding guidance as may be required. So that's the, I would say, end-to-end -end, uh, frame from the supply chain point of view. And this will be a one major complex activity that to be undertaken because uh, for any company, there will be hundreds of suppliers and customers which will be there. For a company to generate its own data, it has taken a lot of time. Now what we are talking is uh, gathering the data from our hundreds of suppliers and customers, and that's going to be a big difficulty. And it's not just about gathering data, but also analyzing the data, looking at the qualitative aspect of and how do we respond to that part. So with this, uh, moving on, so what we also did is that uh, last year, more than 1,000 companies reported on the sustainability performance in a very structured manner. Uh, what we have done is we have gathered the data and analyzed it in to, to get to put some macro uh, pointer around it. And uh, if you can keep moving, there are certain numbers that we can take a look here. So if you look at the overall India in macro insights, right, to say where do we stand, and this is something a very good baseline to start uh, analyzing to say where do we stand, what are those areas where we have been historically doing well, what are the areas where we need to do even better as we move along, and that's where the data will guide us in terms of uh, the, the journey ahead. 
now if you look at some of this uh, data points on the right hand side uh, at the top right the what is the mix of renewable energy in terms of fuel as well as electricity within the overall uh, uh, mix and that's 11 percent for the india right more than thousand companies there which itself is telling that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to move from non-renewable to renewable and uh, that can uh, certainly, apart from the environmental uh, impact, also to an extent on you know, the financial savings that can come along with that one. So that's one significant opportunity on hand. Couple of other things, if you look at uh, this uh, zero liquid discharge, right? There are 60% of the companies uh, who have uh, reported zero liquid discharge in place, which means it is uh, a practice that companies have been following for a while. Now, for the remaining 40 is where the opportunity lies, right? To say that how do we look at uh, implementing ZLD wherever possible and, 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 and enable that uh, risk mitigation there. So that's on that part. Similarly, if we look at some of the other numbers like the total emission, right? Which is where the 1.4 billion uh, ton of CO2 equivalent uh, that we see here is the total quantum of emissions reported by 1,040 companies uh, last year, right? That, that's a huge number to uh, look at. And similarly, coming to the water withdrawal, now water is a big, uh, I would say, the topic or a factor for India as a country, given the water stress uh, uh, levels. And currently, the corporates, the businesses have a footprint of 14 trillion liters of water, right? That's a huge number. Uh, the sources will also be playing an important role in terms of whether it's a surface water, rain water, ground water, but the footprint of how do we reduce and uh, recycle the water so that our uh, incremental footprint is minimal and also how do we within that change the mix from groundwater to a uh, rain uh, water harvesting that's the one important part to look at from the water side of it as we move into social uh, the entire diversity equity side of it that's where this 18 uh, percent is the is the female workforce today in india on an average and uh, while we are far from uh, being gender neutral, but how do we incrementally make progress so that we reach from 18% to a higher number on a year-on-year basis and achieve our gender neutrality in the medium term to long term? That, that's the key uh, milestone to keep in mind. Similarly, on the entire differently abled uh, uh, workforce, right? how do we also create opportunities for uh, differently abled workforce? Currently, that number is very small, 0.6% of the total workforce and uh, in absolute terms, 40,000 uh, people. Now, if we, if we look at this number or a little deeper in terms of what uh, is behind these numbers, if we remove the top five companies, right, which would have this uh, maximum, I would say, number of uh, differently abled uh, workforce employed, the rest of the numbers are very insignificant or very small and that's where we need to look at of how do we create the infrastructure and the opportunities for those people so that uh, uh, they are also part of the entire workforce and uh, for the con at a country level these numbers are much higher it's somewhere between two to five percent of the population is uh, in, in this range of different labeled employees compared to that the ones which is employed is only 0.6 percent so that's where we need to do that uh, bridge gap in terms of uh, uh, opportunities for them. At the bottom on the governance side, what we see here is that uh, the uh, the eighty four percent, right, which is almost all the listed companies have created a board level ESC committee, which itself is a strong commitment to say that ESC is very important, and there's a dedicated board committee uh, which is uh, focusing on this one as part of the board governance. And also from the financial point of view, if you look at the how much money companies are investing on R&D, on CapEx, which are uh, related to environmental and social impact uh, that the company is creating, and that number is around 14 to 16% as we see here. But I think this number will significantly increase as we go along, and, and that's where a lot of uh, discussions which I, I have been part of, companies are looking to increase this number so that our entire innovation, which is uh, uh, channelized toward environmental social impact, is something which is the uh, the key focus across the organizations right now. So that that's a quick, I would say, the macro uh, picture. Certainly, there are sector-wise, uh, company-wise, deep dive will give us much more better idea, but this will also be a good uh, macro view to keep in mind as we move along there. Yeah, so uh, just to uh, also touch upon a little bit on the other emerging technologies, right, to say that how do we use these technologies to uh, enable the entire sustainability transformation, and that's where this uh, artificial intelligence, the satellite data can give us some real-time alerts. 
and also some uh, other in terms of creating awareness in terms of learning and also some data driven analytics to say how do we use this entire macro data to create a top down view and then use it into our decision making this is something which will be a significant uh, uh, i would say the 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 room to leverage and uh, embed in our uh, 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 journey entirely so moving on to the uh, quick one in terms of summarizing uh, the overall, I would say the picture there. So while we looked at end-to-end -end picture, but what are some of those uh, priorities? Need if you can come to the next page. So these are some of the, uh, I would say the big ticket items that we need to keep in mind as we accelerate our uh, performance improvement journey. Uh, one certainly on the entire energy transformation to say that how do we transition from a non-renewable to a renewable energy uh, landscape. That, that's one significant uh, thing to happen. And this is going to be the most complex one because the technologies are there, they, are, they, they need to be economical in nature. So the balance between uh, sustainability impact and the financial impact as it converts, I think that's where the entire uh, scale will come. But this is something going to be a very important one to achieve. The next is on the entire nature and uh, side of it, which is more the biodiversity and the other side to say that how do we uh, also look at nature as the most uh, critical part of it, while the focus has been a lot on the energy and the climate change, but nature itself uh, is also a very important part. And how do we embed that into our decision making in terms of biodiversity and nature related footprint there? Then comes the entire circular economy. While uh, uh, some of the value chains currently could be linear in nature, but how do we move from linear to circular is the entire, I would say, the the, the journey that needs to be undertaken. There are certain pockets in the in the different sectors where the circularity has uh, happened off late, uh, more to, driven by the business imperative, or in some cases also driven by the regulatory mandate on the EPR or other regulation. But uh, this circular economy is something which will certainly help to optimize the resource uh, consumption and uh, the minimize the footprint to that extent. And last year is that on the entire data-led intelligence to say that uh, for us to uh, the monitor and move ahead in our journey, how do we use data as, as, the, as the single source of decision making and not go by some subjective uh, understanding? And that's where the entire availability of structured reliable data is something which is crucial. And that's where all these actions are happening in terms of the regulatory landscape, whether on the reporting side, whether on the assurance side of it. So while it may appear to be a compliance activity, but that's a big enabling uh, role to play there in the, in the entire journey. So uh, coming towards the end of this, and that's where summarizing the overall uh, value. So how do we measure value, right, from this entire sustainability? And that's where uh, the, this triple bottom line, which is uh, people, planet, and pro profit comes into picture. To say that how do we create value for our customers in terms of uh, greener product, innovative product through, through product uh, stewardship. Second, how do we create value for our people and the society at large? This could be by uh, the likes of the diversity and inclusion, skill development and other opportunities which you can create for the society. And last is on the financial side of it to say that while we are doing a lot on the entire this thing, sustainability and environmental social governance, at the end of it, it will also reflect into our better financial performance in terms of revenue, uh, cost, assets, liabilities, and also in terms of the valuation of the enterprise. Right? That, that's where the entire value creation happens. And these are the four buckets in which we need to assess ourselves of uh, how much value we are communicating and use the same framework to communicate our impact assessment there. So that, that's the one that I wanted to touch upon to, to, to summarize or conclude. And uh, with this, I think we, we uh, if, if we can come to the next one, we can uh, move to any questions, answers, any perspectives which anyone has and, and move along there. Yeah. So, Ravi, I'm just seeing a few questions and maybe feel free to or Abha on the questions. But I'll quickly, I know we have only a couple of minutes left uh, in this very intense topic. So one question uh, was on how do we measure value? I think, Ravi, the slide, last slide that you had, uh, in terms of the value drivers and also linking with the financial drivers, I think is a was a slide in that direction. Uh, there are a lot of questions on the value chain uh, because I think that's another next frontier, so to say, because a lot many people are saying that easy to capture within the four walls of the organization. But as we go to our business partners, both upstream, downstream, it's a, it's a big exercise. So I think that's right. Uh, it, it's a big uh, driver that needs to happen. And how do we leverage technology 
uh, with the supplier relationship management platforms and others, I think is, is a very, very uh, important uh, ask that is there. Uh, there are a lot of questions on energy transition. Uh, uh, so your point is right. I think a lot of people are saying that we can't we just move to renewables. Uh, yes, uh, easier said than done. We are moving towards renewable very quickly, but there are cost drivers. There is energy, in, you know, independence aspects at play. Uh, and I think that's why this word that India and all uh, emerging economies are saying that there needs to be a just transition on this carbon budget. So, so you're right. I think the heart of it is energy transition, but uh, obviously we need to take people together in a just uh, manner. I think that's the real aspect, which is uh, obviously at the heart of the geopolitics that happens. And as we all know that, you know, we are also representing through various forums, including the COP that is happening so that we get our fair share. So those are some of the questions. Uh, Abba, maybe I'll pass it back to you uh, in, in the interest of time, but a lot of interest and a lot of questions uh, from, from the audience, which is great for this topic. Now, thank you. You uh, took time to go through all the questions uh, uh, while Ravi was speaking. That was great. We saved a lot of time. Uh, there were some hands raised, but I think they've now put the questions in the chat. There's one more question in the chat now. Uh, Okay, that's a comment. So uh, if people would like to ask questions, they may raise their hand now. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can send in your questions to us later also by mail and we will have them answered by our experts. Yeah, Just oh, absolutely. Comment. I think we'll take all the questions. If there are specific, we will get back to you. So feel full, uh, you know, put in the chat because I know we run out of time and to have the Q&A live may not be possible, but maybe yeah. I think next time, Ava, we could have more time so that there is... Uh, right, it was a fairly discussion. comprehensive presentation. You did uncover a few facets which uh, uh, were very important and uh, you brought to the fore some very important developments, uh, you know, that companies probably may not have thought of. There's one more question uh, at the end, uh, if you could see. Uh, it says, how can foundation or societies help companies achieve their social goals objectives? Can the impact of social initiatives be factored in the ESG framework? Yeah. So absolutely, that's absolutely right. Uh, I think the, the CSR, the, the great work that we are trying to create and the impact, I would say, that most leading foundations are measuring is part of the social bucket in, in, uh, in, in ESG. And I think that's where, uh, obviously, we need to look at both the value uh, that we are creating within the enterprise and also what the value enterprise is creating for our communities and outside, which is where uh, obviously uh, functions and excellence in ESG and uh, I mean CSR and impact that is created. So absolutely, that's part of the measure and this needs to be measured and also communicated to all our stakeholders, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, widely with a lot of trust and confidence. So absolutely, that point is very, very valid and very critical. Uh, yeah, I think there are questions on this KPIs. I know that's that's in terms of how do we harmonize this model. And and I, I think I'll just say as a closing comment on that is that, uh, and the problem with harmonizing is because every stakeholder looks differently. The customer would want to view an enterprise differently. The enterprise, the investors are looking from a providers of capital. The regulators obviously seeing more from a governance lens. And I think that's why, uh, you know, a harmonization of these KPIs or metrics as we call it, or the value drivers becomes difficult, but all leading enterprises, I think, are looking at all the stakeholders. I mean, that's the heart of the ESG strategy or the materiality analysis that we do, so that we are listening to all our stakeholders and obviously navigating and taking them together in that journey. Uh, so with that, Abha, I'll pass it uh, back to you. I know we're run out of time. Also. Yes. So let me thank uh, both uh, you, Nitesh and Ravi for this detailed uh, uh, presentation and uh, um, you know, which has kind of opened uh, many questions in our minds again, and we will uh, definitely be reaching out to you uh, for responding on those questions. As I'm speaking, I see more questions coming in, but I guess we'll have to take that up later. And um, thank you so much uh, for your time. And we do hope to uh, have your support in the future also for uh, these kind of sessions for our stakeholders. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I thank the participants also for being with us today. Do drop in your feedback on the session today and on uh, future sessions that you would like the center to conduct. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Fiki so and, and the team and, and the participant for their patience. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.